On your Monday episode of Locked on Raptors, the Toronto Raptors finally get well with a big win over the Orlando Magic on the heels of a couple of ugly losses to New Orleans and Brooklyn. We'll dig into why chemistry and continuity finally seem to be getting back into the mix for the Raptors and why that's a big deal going forward. We'll also talk about Christian Coloco, who maybe revealed the Raptors need to go and pick up a center before the deadline. We got the good, the bad, and the hmm as well coming up on today's show as we dig into a wild weekend ahead of a big game against the Celtics tonight. It's all coming up. Thanks so much for hanging. You are Locked On Raptors, your daily Toronto Raptors podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey, what's going on? Welcome to episode number 1294 of Locked On Raptors for Monday, December the 5th. I'm your host, Sean Woodley. I've been covering the Toronto Raptors now for nine seasons on various platforms. You can just go follow me on Twitter to follow all my work at Woodley Sean. The show is also on Twitter at Locked On Raptors. We can find links to every single episode of the show. You can also go and follow, subscribe to, rate, and review the podcast for free on your favorite audio podcast apps, Google, Spotify, Odyssey, you name it. Plus, you can also go to YouTube and hit the big red subscribe button over there to support the show in video form each and every day. And I am very much appreciative to all of those who have subscribed to the YouTube channel and uh, plan to in the future as well. All right, on today's show, just me, Vivek Jacob will be back tomorrow for his Big V Monday on a Tuesday. He's very busy with World Cup stuff, which is fine. We got a lot to get to on today's show. I will not be starred for content on a solo day here. The Raptors go one and one over the weekend. Uh, Ugly loss in Brooklyn on Friday to the Nets, particularly a really ugly first quarter that derailed the rest of the game, even though there were some positive signs that crept in as that one progressed. And then a big win over the Orlando Magic on Saturday wire to wire no stress whatsoever it was very very nice to see and we'll dig into sort of my biggest takeaways from those games as a whole kind of tie it back as well to that pelicans game in the middle of the week week last week which i uh, did not get to do a podcast about that said I, I do think the stuff that we saw go wrong against the pelicans and nets There might be a bit of a corner getting turned here, so we'll get into that. We also are going to talk about the need for a center and rim protection at the deadline, the good, the bad, the hmm, all that good stuff. Let's dive in, however, to my big takeaway from the game, and that really is that it's not just the game. I guess there's two games, three games that were kind of all wrapping into one here, but I really do feel like the Raptors struggles against the Pelicans and Nets. To me, as someone who watched these games, and you know, maybe I'm not exactly on point all the time with my sort of read on where things are but I do really feel like those two losses were really symptomatic of just the lack of continuity this team has had all season long we know about the injuries we know about people being in and out of the lineup this has been the story for the team for a couple of years now and maybe at some point we're just going to have to accept that they're not always going to be fully healthy and they're always going to be kind of battling this uphill fight against being you know full of chemistry and continuity and kind of knowing the beats and rhythms that they're supposed to hit in a given game i do feel like though we saw in the second half against brooklyn and in the magic game the sort of benefits of getting to play just a little bit of basketball together starting to bear fruit and this is a team that is so dependent on the interconnectivity the defense is so reliant on stepping into the right spaces to fill for rotations that are going out um you know having that back line room protection having everyone on a string and communicating and kind of knowing where the next move is coming from that's what the whole defense is about And to me, the game against the Nets, the first quarter against the Nets, reeked of just a lack of continuity. And they talked about this on the broadcast. And I, I, you know, I think Alvin Williams does a pretty good job diagnosing what's going on on the floor as someone who played the game. And I think what he was talking about in terms of how the continuity just hasn't been there for the Raptors and the way that kind of seeps into performance, I think that was totally on point. And And I couldn't agree more. Just from the way that I know this team operates, from the way we've seen Nick Nurse teams work in the past, it is a lot about kind of finding the rhythm and then using that rhythm to go on a steamrolling run through the Eastern Conference. That's kind of been their MO. They often get onto these runs where they play really good ball for long stretches. Just as long as they get a few guys in the lineup for a few games in a row, build some sort of consistency with one another, it tends to lead to pretty good things. And they just haven't had that this season You know, the most used lineup for the Raptors right now is their starting five, the small starting five that hasn't actually started since Gary Trent Jr. got back. They played 85 minutes 
That's nothing. That's no minutes at all. That's not even two full games of on-court time together. That is not a lot of time to build any sort of chemistry or continuity. You also go back to the lineup they used to start on Friday and Saturday in Brooklyn and and, in Orlando, which was the first time they had used the same starting five in back-to-back games in like 10 games, I think, or something like that, uh, where Christian Coloco started at center. I, you know, have my qualms with him being used as the starter against the Nets. We'll talk about that in the next segment, but they use the same lineup back-to-back. They play 33 minutes over the course of Friday and Saturday, and all of a sudden that lineup, which on the season has played just 38 minutes, is the fourth most use lineup for the Raptors it's just it's undeniable the lack of continuity which was again the whole thing that this team was built on coming into the season the Rico Hines runs the fact that these guys had played together all summer long the fact they were returning like 92 percent of last year's minutes none of that has really had a chance to pay dividends for the Raptors because of the injuries and the internet of the lineup but I do think there were some positive signs from the second half against the Nets and of course the Magic game where they looked really good you know, it's really nice to get well against Orlando, is it not? They're, they're so bad. It's beautiful. Um, but to me, you know, I, I think the thing we saw it was the shape of the team kind of being reestablished through the lens of the three main wing creators on this team, Pascal Siakam, OG Ananobi, Scotty Barnes. When those three guys play together, when those three guys are playing off one another and using each other's gravity to affect, you know, advantages elsewhere on the floor, when those three guys are allowing a Fred Van Vliet to be a lesser sort of cog in the offense, he can just be off the ball, hit catch and shoots, create a little bit in the pinch. But for the most part, those three wings are the guys who create most of the stuff for the Raptors. When those three guys are together, they're really good on the season so far. They've only played 218 minutes together over 12 games. Um, but when they have Ananobi, Barnes, and OG together, they have 118.7 offensive rating when they're on the floor together, 111.3 defensive rating, a plus 7.4 net. That's really good. That's like top of the league stuff in terms of overall net rating for that lineup if you protract it over the course of a full season. Those three guys, if they're together, if they're playing you know, sort of off of one another, they're really good, and the Raptors are really good as a result. And we saw those three guys, I think, really kind of find their spots and their roles within the hierarchy of the team on Friday and Saturday. You know, when Pascal Siakam is out, it's a little bit of a sort of guessing game as, all right, who's the top dog now? Who is going to, you know, run the, the, the lion's share of the offense? Fred Van Vliet obviously has a bit more of a say in that situation as well. And it, it's just, it becomes really difficult to find a through line from game to game. Pascal Siakam obviously comes in, reestablishes, all right, he's top of the hierarchy. It all kind of flows from him. Everyone else can play off of that, and everyone else can eat off of that as well. As we saw, OG and Scotty both have really nice games. 17 for Scotty on both Friday and Saturday. I thought Saturday he was awesome. The 14 rebounds, just kind of playing with a joy and excitement, which we'll get to a little bit later on in the show as we get to the good, the bad, and the hmm. But I, I just I feel like we saw what the Raptors are intended to be, and we haven't had that many opportunities to see that. And of course, a couple of games after getting your guys back in the lineup, this was Nick Nurse's whole concern last weekend when he started you know Scotty Barnes on the bench Gary Trent Jr. on the bench which might be here to stay uh, more on that later too but we, we saw you know they're just trying to, they were trying to fight it they were trying to find something to sort of get back into a rhythm they didn't want to throw too many fresh faces who had just sat out a bunch of time back into the lineup to go and try to figure things out on the fly together it's just you need reps, especially with the way the Raptors play, especially on defense. You have to have time together. And even though I have my misgivings about the starting five that was used on Friday and Saturday, the fact that they got to play 33 minutes together over the course of two games very clearly paid dividends to me. And I think if you're concerned about big picture stuff with this Raptors team after a couple bad losses to New Orleans and Brooklyn, both of whom are good teams who are playing really well like right now, as much as it is painful to say the Nets are playing well, they are. Um, um, you know, it, it really is to me not that complicated. You get the best players together. You have them play a little bit of time together. This Raptors team is going to be pretty damn tough to beat. And we saw that play out against the Magic. And honestly, in the second half against the Nets, they totally sewered themselves with that 41 to 17 first quarter. Completely were out of touch. They were never going to win that game after that start. But they did start to build on things. It's very hokey and very home broadcastery to say, but like it's true. Like there's, there's something to it. They kind of found something in that second half. 
wonderful Mount Rushmore fake comeback and all of that. But really, I think what mattered was you got a whole half in that second half of OG, Scotty, and Pascal playing off of one another, looking really good. And I think that bled into the game against the Magic, where they kind of found their rhythm and you know, can't come soon enough because the uh, freaking Boston Celtics are in town on Monday night and you have to be on the same page if you're going to even have a chance to give them some trouble. And hopefully it can be a nice little test case to see just how far the continuity and chemistry has come over the last couple of games here with the Celtics in town tonight. Um, I also, I want to just shout out Nick Nurse. I thought he did a good job of just giving the Raptors the opportunity to find that chemistry uh, at the start or in these two games over the weekend. Obviously, the second half, he rolls with his guys. He stays with it late. He doesn't abandon the fake comeback too soon. They give it their all for a good long time, and it was pretty fun to watch. And again, I think those reps were really, really valuable. Same thing against the Magic. You could have shut that thing down after three quarters, probably, and won just just fine. But I like that Nick Nurse went back to his guys in that fourth quarter and played them pretty heavy minutes uh, with one another. You know, no one played crazy minutes in this game. You know, Siakam just 31 minutes, OG 33, Barnes 33, uh, Fred Van Vliet 37. Maybe that's too high for Fred, but I mean, that's just life with Fred, I suppose. Either way, you know, they didn't overtax those guys while they also gave them the chance to kind of play some time together against a low leverage opponent like the Magic, who were not doing a whole lot to offer resistance. It was a perfect canvas upon which to get well. And I, I like that Nick Nurse kind of rode with them. And I think it was valuable. Any extra reps these guys can get together, any extra minutes they can play together is super valuable considering they're kind of starting behind the uh the what are they the, behind the bunny car i don't know there, there's a disadvantage here because they started out of the block so slow in terms of health and continuity since the season began and we're you know over a quarter of the way into the year now and it just kind of feels like maybe now they have a chance to build some of that we're going to come back on the other side get into christian coloco's weekend uh particularly that first quarter against the nets why i didn't love the choice to start him but why i also understand why they did it and why i think maybe the uh, need for a rim protecting center is becoming very very plain plainly obvious over the last couple of games here we'll get to that in just one sec but first got to tell you better friends over at betonline.net who are the number one place for sports betting info stats news and analysis get the latest odds and trends for every professional and amateur league out there from football to basketball to soccer the world cup's going on baby go and check it out they got esports as well everything under the sun it's over at betonline.net and they are here to make you the informed wager they're going to give you the information you need to make the right bets as opposed to just throwing your money down indiscriminately they're going to help you win some actual scratch with their great information analysis injury reports podcasts it's all there for you to peruse to make sure you are betting smart we are they are the fastest and easiest way to get your betting fix head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more bet online is where the game starts all right we continue on here with your first listen of the day digging into the toronto raptors weekend one and one split against the brooklyn nets and the orlando magic and i think a storyline from this weekend for me that i want to dig into here is the very clear need i think for the Raptors to seriously consider upgrading their rim protection situation. And in particular, the center spot, in particular, the Christian Coloco spot. And look, I'm pretty high on Christian Coloco. I I think we've seen, you know, his on-off splits this season. They're kind of undeniable. When he's on the floor, the Raptors are much better defensively. That's very obvious. And I think there's a lot of upside there for Christian Coloco as a drop defender in the future, as a guy who can kind of come up to the level of the screen and cause some havoc as well. He's had a few nice moments of sort of tagging the roller as well as the ball handler and just using his incredible length to kind of wall off those options. I think his performance against the Hawks in that shorthanded game is kind of the perfect example of that. There's a lot to like about Christian Coloco. He's also a second round pick rookie who very clearly is not consistent enough to bring it each and every night. And that's okay. Look, it's, it's, you shouldn't be expecting a 30, a 33rd overall pick center to be everything you need to fix all of your defensive woes in their first season. It's been really nice to see the flashes and I'm really excited to see more of them as the season goes along. But I also think if the Raptors are serious about making a deep run of the playoffs this year, which look, I don't think there's any reason why they shouldn't be serious about that. Is the sort of top two spot, you know, situation kind of spoken for? Yeah, Milwaukee and Boston are incredible. They're going to run away with it. They're probably going to be the teams in the conference finals unless some weird luck breaks or whatever. And that's just the way it is. And that's fine. Those teams are incredible. And, you know, they deserve to be kind of viewed with such reverence, I think. But 
You talk about the third, four, five seeds in the Eastern Conference. There's no reason why the Raptors can't be one of those teams. No reason they can't be the third seed. Right now, they're two games in the loss column back of the Cavaliers. And again, going back to the first segment, they haven't had their dudes together at all. They've had their three most important wing players play together 12 games at a 23. There's a chance here for the Raptors to really get on a heater here. And I, and I think there's a reason to think that they can be the team that gives one of Milwaukee or Boston hell in a second round series. There's no reason to not think that can at least be the the sort of the, the hope for expectations this season for the team. But I do think to get there, they're going to have to figure out this rim protection situation. And I, and I just don't know if Christian Coloco was quite ready. And again, that's fine. You can go and do a couple of things. You can go and find someone who's going to be more of a long-term solution. Maybe you go and try to trade for Miles Turner from the Pacers. If the Pacers fall down the standings, which they you know, they've lost a couple in a row here, if they start to fall down and look at trading Miles Turner, which, by the way, I, I don't think they should be trading uh, Miles Turner. I think the Pacers should just stay good and keep their dudes together, and that would be great. Um, but if they do come to the point where they want to trade Miles Turner, maybe that's a way the Raptors can look at this and say, hey, maybe we just kind of reorient what our future core is going to look like and try to make Miles Turner part of the long-term plans. What does that mean for a Fred Van Vliet or a Gary Trent Jr.? I'm not really sure, but that's something they could look at. And I think Miles Turner would have, would sort of affect change in that rim protection department, be that last line of defense the Raptors need and be a pretty good option there. Obviously the cost of acquisition would be very high as it should be because Miles Turner's playing his ass off. Um, then there's Jakob Pertl, who I, I think is kind of the guy for me. I really think Jakob Pertl, while he can't shoot free throws and maybe isn't going to play crunch time for you, I'm not sure the Raptors desperately need a guy who can be a crunch time solution for them necessarily. I just think they need someone who can be a valuable rim protector type, who can play against bigger centers, who can be that backstop to what the Raptors do defensively and really kind of tie the whole thing together. Not dissimilar to how Marc Gasol tied the Raptors' defense together when he was brought over to the Raptors. Obviously, Gasol's a better player than Pirtle ever will be, but I, I do think there is just a, a real desperate need for that excellent rim protection. And we've seen it because the Raptors have been very successful with Coloco on the floor for the most part this season. Again, he's got the best on-off defensive splits of anyone on the team, but the fouling, the sort of inconsistency, the lack of finishing around the basket, and credit to him, he threw out a couple of dunks against the Magic on Saturday. That was great, but he really struggles going up and kind of getting it knocked free, having his shot contested. He can't really finish through contests just yet. He's not quite strong enough for it or doesn't realize he's strong enough for it yet. Whatever, I'm not exactly sure what's going on there, but... The night-to-night -night ups and downs, it's fine for a, a guy to have those, but when you have higher ambitions, you probably got to have some sort of insurance policy in place for the back part of the season. And I feel like a Yaka Pirtle would be perfect for that. He's an expiring contract. You can probably get him for not crazy, uh, not a crazy sum in terms of the overall cost of acquisition, maybe a single first-round pick. I don't really know. It's probably going to be a bidding war for that dude, and maybe the Raptors are going to find themselves drawing short. But if you can get a guy like that who's a rental, Bring him in to be your backstop, be your starting center, uh, maybe close some games for you as long as the hack a yak thing doesn't start to sort of per, you know uh, rear its ugly head. You, you have that option, and I just I feel like it will tie everything to, together so nicely. We've already seen the Raptors realize they don't need Gary Trent Jr. shooting in the starting five necessarily. They can get by with what they have and, and be pretty effective. Jakob Pertl is a nice passer. You could run some stuff with, with him from the elbows, you know, pick out cutters, OG, Scotty, Pascal, etc. Uh, I do think there's a way in which that, that sort of lineup configuration could work, even with the shooting concerns. Um, and, and I just feel like you're going to get such a better baseline of performance from Jakob Pertl than you will from Coloco, who on his best nights is awesome and looks exactly like what the Raptors need, but also has nights where he looks like a rookie drafted in the second round. And, you know, the fouling, he did, in credit to him, he picked up no foul in the game against the Nets I think it's maybe because he didn't come close to contesting a single shot around the rim uh, but it, it, good for him there he picked up three fouls in 18 minutes against the Magic he's picking up fouls left right and center and that's just how it's going to be for a rookie big man who's still kind of figuring out how to control his body and how to play the position in the NBA um, and, and I think long term Coloco as the center of this lineup that the Raptors have constructed here with their core four guys that's that's got a lot of legs to me but right now for this season, I feel like this weekend revealed a lot. The Pelicans game revealed a lot. 
It's just not quite there yet with Coloco. And I think having some other reliable backup center option that you can roll to or a starting center option, whomever, um, I I think is kind of the way to go here. I I don't know if Ken Birch is going to be able to offer that sort of high level of play. He also feels like he kind of oscillates. I'd love for Chris Boucher to be that guy, but maybe he just doesn't quite quite have the beef to roll against the biggest centers in the league. Um, Pirtle feels like a perfect stopgap sort of rental solution. And, And, you know, there's other guys out there that I'm sure we'll talk about in the lead up to the deadline, but him and Turner are kind of the two guys that pop to mind because good rim protectors don't grow on trees and usually when people have them they don't want to give them away either so we'll see but I I feel like this weekend was kind of revealing if we didn't already know before I feel like it did kind of confirm that as much as Christian Coloco's got some juice it it might not be totally ripe just yet that that might have been weird either way uh we'll continue on here on the other side and wrap up my thoughts on the weekend with the good, the bad, and the hmm from the two games against the Nets and the Magic. And we'll send you off into the game against the Boston Celtics tonight. We'll get to that in just one second. But first, got to tell you about Turo, which is a new sponsor for the channel. And it's the world's largest car sharing marketplace. With Turo, you can book any car you want wherever you want it from a community of local hosts. Browse a, browse a huge selection of vehicles for just about any occasion or budget across the US, UK, Canada, and Australia. Uh, it's a wonderful service. If you're going on a trip, Paying for a rental car is just so laborious. It costs a lot of money. You probably got to go to the airport to pick it up. It's not the most exciting experience in the world. But with Turo, you can find affordable economy cars if you're on a budget and just got to get from A to B. You can also get a classic or luxury car if you want to sort of celebrate a birthday, a holiday, a, a honeymoon, something like that. We had a really sweet car on my honeymoon, but we paid too much for it because it wasn't a Turo. Uh, and so... Turo is the way to go. Many Turo hosts even can deliver the car directly to you, which is amazing, especially if you're going to a new city, you don't want to navigate around too much. You can just have people bring it to you at your hotel, your Airbnb, whatever it might be. Either way, every trip is backed by liability insurance. Terms, conditions, and exclusions apply. Forget boring rental cars and find your drive at Turo.com. That's T-U-R-O.com. All right, let's get to it. The good, the bad, and the hmm to round out today's show and uh for me i I think we'll start with the good obviously and the good for me is scotty barnes really nice to see scotty barnes kind of get back to being scotty barnes on friday and mostly on saturday of course really efficient shooting eight of ten against the magic not that the magic are offering a whole lot of resistance but that was really nice to see getting to his spots that floater touch was on point the long floater (laughs) you know the the sort of bizarro in between jump shot that scotty busts out was right there getting exactly where he wanted to go you know didn't seem as you know bothered by the knee injury didn't seem to have his burst affected in any way and just was like in the mix grabbing and going off of rebounds you know the 14 rebounds really nice to see from scotty and the most notable thing to me is that he had a smile on his face all freaking night he scored a single bucket walked down the other end he's smiling his ass off it it was great to see and that's scotty barnes right like when scotty is happy and joyful scotty barnes is good essentially as a rule and it felt like maybe the joy had been sapped a little bit the last couple games you have to imagine the constant barrage that his knee and ankle or knees and ankles are taking has to have some sort of effect on the sort of psyche when you go night to night but it was really great to see scotty kind of do his thing and be scotty freaking barnes in the second half against the nets and mostly against the magic on saturday and you have to be happy to see that joy come back in I don't think it's a coincidence that you know you start playing with Pascal Siakam a little bit things get easier uh OG starts going off and by the way OG I I mean we can loop this into the good as well I just it's like it just feels like standard at this point to be talking about OG being incredible and it feels boring but like 32 and four assists and three steals 12 of 17 shooting and two of four from deep against the magic he was insane just ripping the ball from dudes and going to dunk the cookie at the other end. Just, um, man, I, I, I can't get enough of OG. He's incredible. Pascal was awesome too. But for me, I think the return of happy Scotty and joyful Scotty was a, a really, really beautiful thing to see. A team best plus 34 against the Magic as well. Um, and, and, you know, that OG Siakam Barnes trio is, is something pretty special, man. And I think Barnes has been the guy who's kind of been lagging the most. And it was really good to see him kind of recapture the, the just sort of the the fervor and joy that typically accompanies the best Scotty Barnes performances. Um, we'll talk about OG. We've talked about so much OG that I feel weird, like 
not talking about him, but also like we get it now. He's incredible. He's like fighting for an all star spot at this point. He's awesome. Um, we'll we'll have more OG, I'm sure, as the week goes on because he does crazy things every week. Let's go to the bad. For me, it's Fred Van Vliet shooting, and it's not that it's something I'm worried about being like a long term thing necessarily. You know, I know there was some sort of uh, references to other small point guards who lose their juice at a, at a later age or whatever. But Fred's still like 28. He's still got time. I would not be worried about Fred Van Vliet falling off a cliff just yet. He's had a rough shooting season, but I think it's very much tied to the types of shots he's been taking, mostly since Pascal Siakam originally went out with injury in that Dallas game. And it just, like, he feels like he maybe just has to, like, reorient the shot distribution here and things are going to come back to him. The pull-ups just aren't working for him this season. He's at about 32.5%, and, you know, he, he's just, it's not his shot right now. And that's, you know, that's not the best. Obviously, the pull-up three is a thing that's really kind of helped him expand his game. But in the context of this team, if you have Siakam and OG and Barnes kind of running the show most of the time, you don't need Fred to be bombing a bunch of pull-up threes per game. But ever since Siakam went out that time, you know, against the Mavericks, now I guess a month ago today, uh, or just just over a month ago, I don't know, early November, it sucked, it was bad. Uh, Either way, you know, Fred's like he's just he's taking too many pull-ups let me get to the numbers here before i lose my train of thought uh since siakam went out he's averaging 5.6 pull-up threes a game that's a lot of pull-up threes especially when you compare to the fact that before siakam got hurt he was averaging two and a half pull-ups to 3.7 catch and shoots that number has been basically even across the board 3.7 3.8 basically in any segment of the season you find for fred that's the number of, uh, of catch and shoots, but the pull-ups have gone up significantly in the last month. And I think that is the biggest reason why you're seeing his three point percentage go down. He's one of the best catch and shoot guys in the league. He's only at about 38% this season, which is below his standard. But I feel like as the Raptors kind of, again, regain continuity, figure out the shape that the team is supposed to take that they haven't really had been able to assume at all this year. Fred's going to have his chances to kind of move off ball a little bit more often and hopefully better success will come. You know, I even think we saw it in the Magic game. I don't have the exact numbers in front of me, but anecdotally speaking, it seemed like he was off ball a little bit more often. He shot three of eight from deep, which is perfectly acceptable. Obviously, you know, the, the volume and the the makes are, are both very important for him. And maybe you want to see more than eight threes for, for Fred for a team that doesn't shoot a ton of threes. But either way, you know, I, I think the pull-up three situation is very much the thing that's dragged his shooting down. And if you can kind of have Fred nestle into a very comfortable role as the fourth guy on this team, who's just mostly taking catch and shoots and playmaking on the second side, running pick and rolls with the bench, that type of thing, I feel like that's a perfect spot for him to beat and not over leverage him, not overextend him, not burn him into the ground and make his knees into rubble before the playoffs begin. And to me, it, you know, he's just got to course correct that um, the, the 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 pull up to three to uh, catch and shoot ratio and flip it back so the catch and shoots are outnumbering the pull ups. And I think Fred VanVleet will be on his merry way. Um, but for now, the ba- the shooting is bad. Like he's got to shoot better. The Raptors can't be having Fred VanVleet putting up one first, uh, you know, against teams like the Nets and Pelicans. You just can't do it. Lastly, the hmm is the Gary Trent bench off the bench thing. I'm pretty sure it's here to stay. Um, you know, and I think the sort of very different performances we've seen from Trent the last three games are kind of the reason why Gary Trent Jr. on the bench maybe makes some sense. In the starting five, you know, you're reliant on that guy. He's probably going to play 30 plus minutes. If you have a bad Gary Trent Jr. game, that can kind of drag things down. And that's the sort of player that Gary Trent Jr. kind of seems to be. He oscillates a little bit. He'll get onto crazy heaters. Of course, we've seen him score 30 plus in five straight games before. That's amazing, but it's not what he's doing every single night. And of course, the defense has kind of waxed and waned this year too, as Nick Nurse has been no, uh, not shy to call out. And so I just feel like if you have Trent coming off the bench, you're so much less reliant on a big Trent game. If he goes off, great. Close the game with him. That's perfect. Wonderful. If he's having a good Gary Trent Jr. game, by all means, play him heavy minutes. But when you're bringing him off the bench, when the shooting is maybe not quite the necessity that it's always been, which, hey, it's partly because he's not hitting them as well, and it's partly because the Raptors have a few other guys who are able to hit threes right now at a pretty reasonable clip. Either way, it's less of a sort of dependent, relied upon skill that the Raptors like desperately needed to have in the lineup last year to have any success on offense. We talked about that quite extensively. You know, this year it's it's less the case, and you can survive and weather a bad Gary Trent Jr. game and just relegate him to the bench if you need to, and that's totally 
fine. There's nothing wrong with that. And, and you're not sapping your ability to kind of have a big night because you, uh, you got other guys who can kind of step in and, and fill in the void. You know, Juancho Hernan Gomez, hopefully he's all right. He rolled an ankle in that Magic game, but hopefully he's back and okay against the Celtics. I don't think we have an update on him just yet. Either way, he's capable of knocking in a three. Uh, we know that Barnes and Siakam have kind of been a little more effective, or at least a little bit more eager in Barnes' case to take threes this year, at least in catch and shoot spots. Um, you know, Chris Boucher is obviously not hitting his threes right now at all. Like, there's still a need for Gary Trent Jr. shooting, at least especially when Otto Porter Jr. is not available. But, but again, it's not like a relied upon skill. It's not an outlier skill on the team anymore. And that's in part because he's just not shooting him very well right now. So what's the point of having him out there if he's going to go one of seven anyway? But... Yeah, it just feels like to me this bench experiment with Trent is kind of the perfect spot for him. I don't think he's necessarily great at creating for himself and creating for others in the second unit, and he's going to need the help of one of Siakam, Ananobi, Barnes, or Van Vliet, or maybe two of them to really kind of eat in those second unit situations. But I do feel like the three games we've seen uh, these last, I guess, what, four or five games now, I guess, since he came back, it's been more than three. But I feel like it's here to stay, and I, maybe this is late to the, you know, entering into the hmm second of the show but uh, I feel like what I've seen now I, I feel pretty good that Gary Trent Jr. is just going to be reserved the rest of the year and the impacts of that will be interesting but I feel like that's where we're at at the moment and I have no problem with it who the fifth starter is you know maybe Trent will be in there some nights maybe it's Thad Young some nights maybe it's Boucher some nights maybe it's Jakob Pertle after they trade for him I don't know and Coloco is obviously going to keep getting some run here I think but um, either way it's uh, it's nice to see the team kind of falling into shape and, and sort of the pieces coming together in a nice way. And this could all get blown to bits by the Boston Celtics tonight because they're just that good. Either way, we will talk about that game tomorrow with Vivek Jacob. We're looking forward to that. In the meantime, thank you so much for tuning in to today's show. We will be uh, yeah, back for the regular full week schedule after last year, uh, last, last week's travel situation. Apologies for that. But we're back. We're all good. We're set to run. Busy week for the Raptors as well with the Lakers coming up. A couple more games against the Magic. It's going to be a fun one. So thank you very much for tuning in. Go and take a listen now to Locked On Sports Today, which is our daily general sports podcast hosted by Pete Bukowski here on the Locked On Network. A great 22-minute recap of all the important stuff that happened in sports the night before. Go check it out if you are a sports fan. It's basically essential listening at this point. So go check out Locked On Sports Today wherever you get your podcasts. And with that, we will round it out. We'll talk to you Tuesday, breaking down the Raptors-Celtics game. Enjoy the game tonight, everybody. Bye-bye.